Lecture 4.1, Entrepreneurship and Innovation. The essential role of innovation in economic growth can be illustrated with a simple thought experiment. Suppose that throughout the history of the United States, the only way to produce more food for a growing population had been to plow and plant more land. What would have happened? Right, there would have been a point where we ran out of land effectively stopping further population growth. But we know that didn't happen. Indeed, the population of the United States continues to grow and farm acreage continues to shrink. Granted that specialization and trade play an important role in that shrinking acreage, of paramount importance to our long history of economic growth has been our ability through innovation to produce more and more output per acre of land. The economist Julian Simon called human ingenuity, the creativity that leads to innovation, the ultimate resource. It's creativity and innovation that has allowed us to increase production even as we face the ever-present reality of finite resources. Let's turn our attention to entrepreneurship and innovation as we continue our investigation of whether capitalist institutions can help the poor. We've talked before about the importance of productivity in increasing wealth and standards of living. As Charles Whelan reminds us in Naked Economics, productivity is the efficiency with which we convert inputs into outputs. Does it take 2,000 hours for a Detroit auto worker to make a car? or 210 hours? Can an Iowa corn farmer grow 30 bushels of corn on an acre of land, or 210 bushels? The more productive we are, the richer we are. We're better off today than at any other point in the history of civilization because we are better at producing goods and services than we have ever been. The bottom line is that we work less and In 1870, the typical household required 1,800 hours of labor just to acquire its annual food supply. Today, it takes about 260 hours of work. We can reduce Whelan's explanation of our ability to produce more with less to this simple formula. We innovate. The ability to grow more on less land or to produce cars in one-tenth the time is not magic, it's technology. In the lesson outline, Paul Romer explains the role of technology and innovation in economic growth by using a kitchen analogy. Quote, to create valuable final products, we mix expensive ingredients together according to a recipe. If economic growth could be achieved only by doing more and more of the same kind of cooking, we would eventually run out of raw materials. Human history teaches us, however, that economic growth springs from better recipes, not just from more cooking. If we think of our cooks as entrepreneurs and their better recipes as innovation, we have an apt metaphorical explanation for the wealth of Western developed nations. It's not an exaggeration to say that the history of market economies since the Industrial Revolution is the story of worn, rusted, archaic production recipes being continually supplanted by new technology, shinier, faster, more prolific, more amazing recipes for production. This lesson then focuses on how two institutions, markets and entrepreneurship, generate innovation. As we examine the institutionalization of innovation in the modern world, we find overwhelming evidence to justify two conclusions. First, that market economies are unique in creating incentives that generate innovation. And second, that innovation confers its greatest benefits on the poor. We'll examine the institutionalization of entrepreneurial innovation in this lecture and the impact of innovation on the lives of the poor in the next. Although it often manifests itself as tools, instructions, and machinery, technology is, in the most fundamental sense, simply knowledge. Technological change, therefore, is an increase in our collective body of knowledge. In the economic sense, technology translates knowledge into a pool of instructions or recipes that we tap in order to make goods and services. So, how does that happen? If we lay out the process, we find several distinct steps. First is invention. 
the basic discovery of new knowledge. Important? Yes. Essential, in fact. But in terms of economic growth, it's not sufficient. Think of it this way. Knowledge is a pure public good. You can discover it, give it away, and still have as much as you had before. So if the reason that some economies generate wealth and others do not is differences in knowledge, in technology, then transferring knowledge would reduce poverty. But it doesn't. It's the second step, innovation, the application of knowledge to productive processes that spurs economic growth. And innovation is inextricably tied to entrepreneurship, the willingness to take the risks of production. In the most plebeian terms, an entrepreneur is simply one who decides how to use resources and takes responsibility for that decision. In more lyrical terms, noted theologian and economist Michael Novak portrays entrepreneurship as a special calling and credits it with transforming work from simple labor into, quote, the most dynamic source of wealth the world has ever known. In Business as a Calling, he writes, Entrepreneurship is a habit or disposition, in this case a disposition of both the intellect and the will. It is a disposition first to notice, to gain an insight into, to discover something that others unseeingly pass by. It's a disposition second to choose to take a risk, well before one in twenty of the factors necessary to generate success are known, and to begin making happen what the agent sees as at least a possibility. Enterprise further requires the habitual courage necessary to realize a dream. It is first a dream, and then a determined, persistent, and self-correcting process of making it real. We can see the inextricable connection between entrepreneurship, innovation, and markets by taking another look at the history of economic growth since the Industrial Revolution. World economic growth in the millennium before the Industrial Revolution was essentially zero. And although the agricultural revolution raised standards of living, life was, for most people, still, as we saw in the introductory lecture, nasty, brutish, and short. Few people experienced any comforts, and even the very well-off had little more than what had been available in ancient Rome. The problem was that economic growth during that thousand-year period was sporadic and often serendipitous. There were occasional technological improvements, but more often growth was the result of unsustainably bountiful harvests. In between those fortuitous harvests, there were long periods of economic stagnation. Exacerbating the problem was the fact that periods of growth created the very conditions that brought growth to an end. They created more people. When more was produced, that is, when incomes rose, population increased, which increased the pressure on the available resources, which then caused incomes, and eventually population, to fall. In that environment, innovation was happenstance, not institutionalized as it is in market economies today. And it was definitely not associated with scientific research. Examples of early innovators include not professional researchers, but, for example, a wig maker, Richard Ockwright, who designed the modern textile factory system, and a confectioner, Nicholas Appert, who discovered the process of canning. The first industrial revolution, from 1750 to about 1790, generated a wave of technology inventions, knowledge, followed by a ripple of succeeding innovations. The important results were the well-documented increased productivity and decreased production costs that raised standards of living by making more available at lower prices. An even greater impact on long-term economic growth, however, was the second industrial revolution that began in about 1875 and resulted by the eve of the First World War in the institutionalization of sustained innovation, a process that in turn firmly established the economic dominance of the countries rimming the North Atlantic. Let's look at how it worked. First, entrepreneurship became firmly linked to science. The rise of industrial science created a permanent pathway from invention, the discovery of knowledge, to innovation, the application of knowledge to productive processes. We can actually trace the development of this link in the history of the United States. 
1836, chemists in Boston and Philadelphia opened independent industrial research laboratories, taking on themselves the risk of innovation and then marketing their innovations to producer customers. By the 1870s, that had changed. Businesses had begun to establish their own industrial labs. Railroad labs searched for materials to improve rail strength, and Carnegie hired research chemists to fine-tune and reduce the cost of steel production processes. By the turn of the century, there were almost 150 industrial research labs in the United States, as businesses became increasingly aware that cost-saving innovation was a key to competitive advantage. By the 1920s, the number of industrial research facilities had passed 500, and many were charged not only with the improvement of existing products and processes, but also with the development of new ones. The creation of this link isn't surprising when we focus on incentives. Entrepreneurs profit by selling products at prices higher than their production costs. In competitive markets, without the ability to influence price, they engage in a never-ending struggle to reduce production cost, to introduce a new product, to devise a better production process. Innovation is their most valuable tool in the quest for ongoing profit. And the evidence is conclusive. Market economies encourage entrepreneurship are the most innovative, and as a consequence, the wealthiest. In How the West Grew Rich, authors Nathan Rosenberg and L. E. Birdsell explain why economies that rely on entrepreneurship and markets, rather than on central direction, are better innovators and therefore better able to produce wealth. They begin by emphasizing the distinction between invention, which may and often does result from individual initiative, and innovation, which is entrepreneurial in its very core. The rewards of innovation go primarily to enterprises rather than to inventive individuals. The payment of a reward is dependent upon the commercial success of the innovation. Since commercial success requires manufacturing and marketing, the rewards of innovation can be captured only by enterprises. Economies that encourage enterprise, that is, market economies, are uniquely structured to reap the benefits of innovation. The advantages of markets over central direction include the greater number and diversity of innovative inquiry and risk-taking efforts. The more potential innovators, the greater the chance of successful innovation. Think of the marvels of modern life that emerged from dorm rooms, garages, and university science projects in the United States, rather than from centralized government-directed research in China or the Soviet Union. Innovation also flourishes where entrepreneurship is encouraged by clearly defined property rights and rule of law. We saw in earlier lessons how the burden of regulation and the inability to collateralize property stifle entrepreneurial activity in many developing nations. Once an economy establishes entrepreneurship, it can depend on the incentive structure of the market to foster innovation. The positive incentive of profit is an obvious one, and it's extremely powerful. However, it's important not to overlook the role that a negative incentive, the threat of failure, has played in institutionalizing innovative activity in modern business. Innovation has become perhaps the competitive tool for business in developed economies because markets incorporate a feedback loop between consumer and producer that makes successful entrepreneurs alert to the possibilities for the next new product, the next improvement, the next reduction in marginal cost that's necessary for them to stay in business. This creates a sustained stream of innovation. We've seen throughout history that the disconnect between invention and innovation is disastrous to economic growth. Witness the genius of Soviet science that never translated into consumer goods and services. We've also ample evidence that non-market economies can innovate, sporadically, but without markets, they haven't the incentive to sustain innovation. Witness the Chinese junk, a marvel of the 15th century that persisted into the 19th century, even as market innovation introduced the 15th century carrick the 16th century galleon, the 18th century East Indiaman, and the 19th century steamship in the West. The constant revolutionizing of the instruments of production, 
that Karl Marx identified in the mid-19th century turned out not to be the weakness of capitalism that he predicted, but instead one of its major strengths. The threat of failure that hangs over those who aren't part of the revolutionizing process proves to be a powerful incentive. And even actual failure is, it turns out, good for the long-term well-being of an economy. The term creative destruction, coined by Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter, captures the renewing impact of the competitive need to innovate. Princeton research economist William Balmo, writing in The Free Market Innovation Machine, argues convincingly that the fast pace of technological change in the late 20th century made innovation a routine part of modern business. Firms recognize the bottom line. They must innovate or their products and processes will be rapidly eclipsed by their competitors. Innovation has become part of firms' day-to-day -day activities. In the United States, we can see this development in the fact that 70% of research and development expenditure in our economy as a whole is made by private enterprise. In addition to generating benefits for individual enterprises, this institutionalization of innovation has created a significant positive externality. It turns out that innovation begets innovation. New products and processes give others ideas for more new products and processes. And the profit from those innovations is a powerful incentive drawing more time and talent to innovative and entrepreneurial endeavors. Thus, we can clearly see that markets, entrepreneurship, and innovation are, and have been historically, powerful generators of wealth. The three classroom activities that accompany this unit help students clarify the distinction between invention and innovation, discover the source of major 20th century innovations, and figure out why a highly literate and educated nation like the Soviet Union produced little innovation. While we've established the connection between a nation's economic institutions and its wealth, we've not yet addressed the question of whether or not the innovative activity benefits the poor. We'll return to that question in Lecture 4.2.